Okay, hello everyone. Can you hear me all right? Um, so there's going to be a lot of overlap with what you just heard, but I'll try to differentiate a little bit. I'm uh, Drummond Fielding. I'm a grad student at UC Berkeley. I work with Elliot Quadert. I'll uh, tell you a little bit about a paper that we recently put out with Mike McCourt and Todd Thompson. Generally speaking, this is what it's going to be on. It's, um, we have a somewhat different approach to the usual way of studying CGM, and I think it's really complementary to what we just heard. Uh, so I'll, I'll briefly just contextualize the way I'm, I, I like to think about the CGM, and then I'll get into our approach, which is uh, far more idealized than the usual um, cosmological simulation approach. And it sort of serves as a bridge between cosmological simulations and analytic work and, and uh, sort of small box idealized simulations. Um, yeah, so bridge between the two. I'll, I'll quickly talk about some results about the interplay of the winds in the CGM. And then I'll finish with uh, some future directions that I want to sort of, uh, I want to be an invitation to everyone here if you have any interest in uh, using our setup or if you have any ideas for things that you think we should include. Uh, please let us know. So everyone here knows this picture, most likely. This is, um, this is the first thing I think of when I think of the CGM. This is uh, a picture that's been around since the late 70s, but was really crystallized by Birnbaum and Deckel in the early 2000s. Uh, and what I'm showing here is halo mass versus redshift. And there is this critical halo mass at 10 to the 11.5 solar masses, above which newly accreted gas, when it shock heats, going to have a long cooling time relative to the uh, relevant dynamical times. And I, sh I should mention, this is only considering cosmic accretion and cooling. So this is about as stripped down of a model as you can have. Um, and when you're below this critical halo mass, newly accreted gas should cool very rapidly and uh, uh, will not form a quasi-static halo. And so what the main difference physically, I would say, is up here, these halos, the accretion rate onto the galaxy is set by the cooling rate of the CGM, whereas down here it's more set by the uh, cosmic accretion rate. And so uh, what I want to do is try to assess how does stellar feedback modify this picture. So take the, the zeroth order picture and make, say, a first order picture, um, adding just the minimum next level of complexity. And of course, this is obviously included in all the cosmological simulations like we just heard. But this is just uh, sort of doing it in an incremental step so we can see where this model works and where this model uh, falls apart. And we're essentially trying to develop a picture that explains how star formation feedback limits the efficiency with which uh, galaxies turn gas into stars and can explain the, uh, you know, the necessary amount of energy that needs to be injected into the CGM to support these clouds like Cameron just told us about. So, I'll spend a few minutes telling you about my, my setup here. So we ran some uh, 3D, you know, very idealized, uh, somewhat cosmological-like simulations using Athena. And these are our ingredients. I'll step through them each one at a time, except for I'll just stress now that um, our cooling, we assume photoionization equilibrium, and we don't allow the metallicity to vary. Keep that in mind later. Um, future work, we certainly will. So our, our setup is as follows. We have a dark matter potential that is fixed in time and extends out to twice the virial radius, which is the outer boundary of our domain. We then feed in gas at some rate that we calibrated to cosmological simulations, uh, which we can also play around with a little bit. And then we also have an inner domain. And this is where the idealized nature of our simulations becomes really clear. Uh, cosmology, this is our galaxy. It is just. Uh, you know, it is both a sink and a source. So cosmological simulations are inherently Lagrangian, so all their resolution follows the densest structures. Um, we wanted to really throw our resolution out into the CGM, so we just uh, treat the galaxy as both a, a sink, so gas is allowed to enter into the galaxy, and as a source. So for every bit that enters in, we kick back out a certain fraction parameterized by uh, the mass loading factor and the wind velocity. Um, and I'd say as, as a community, I don't think we've really got an a priori understanding of how feedback works, whether it's stellar feedback or AGN feedback. So we uh, use the, the inexpensive nature of these simulations, since we're not actually simulating the galaxy themselves, to just uh, 
try a huge number of models. And we, <laughs> I, ran, I ran probably about 100 of these simulations. For today, I'll just talk about uh, ones that sort of bracket the expected range from theory and from simulations. Um, and, so, and I should also mention that I'm, I'm saying in a pretty tight halo mass range from 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 11 solar masses. Um, and one last aside before I show you what these simulations actually look like, uh, I'll say we're only focusing on the Z of zero universe thus far. And there's two reasons for this. One is we want to sync up with the cost halos observations. And two is that, uh, as Nir taught us, we don't really think we can resolve filaments that well. Transonic shear flows require extremely high resolution to model accurately. And so to avoid the necessity of having filaments, we, uh, we focus on the Z of zero universe where 10 to the 12 solar mass halo is at or below a projector mass. So they're likely living within a filament rather than at the nexus of filaments. And so accretion should be mostly spherical. All right, so let's get to the, the good stuff. So remember in this uh, zeroth order picture, above 10 to the 11.5 solar masses, we expect there to be a hot halo. So here is a 10 to the 12 solar mass halo. Here is density and temperature. This movie will run for nine giga years. And you'll see we got some cool stuff going on. Generally, there is a hot halo. There's some cool uh, thermal instability triggering some feedback. I, I could have talked all about the thermal instability. So if any of you are here are interested in that, please talk to me afterwards. But you'll see that this generally agrees with the zeroth order picture where we get a nice hot halo that's long lived in these high mass halos. But what happens when we, when we push to, to lower masses? Now, now we're below this so-called critical halo mass and uh, we'll see very different behavior. This is a 10 to the 11 solar mass halo. And we started out with an initial shock to help it out, but that rapidly cools and we transition to a very different state where we have uh, inflowing accreted material directly interacting with outflowing wind material. And the CGM is no longer anywhere near hydrostatic equilibrium. It's very turbulent. And it's, uh, you know, the properties of the CGM are really going to be sensitive to uh, the properties of feedback. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll touch on this just very briefly. If we look at the number density profiles of the different halos from 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12, as expected, what we just saw in that movie, there's a much higher sensitivity to feedback. These are the, each line is a different feedback model. Um, you can see in the 10 to the 11s, there's far more sensitivity than in the 10 to the 12s, sort of as expected and very similar to what Cameron just showed us. So we can, we can compare to observations, which is probably a little more useful. So we can take our simulations and make maps of any species we want. Here's an example of uh, oxygen 6 in a 10 to the 11.5 solar mass halo. And we can compare this to, uh, we can make profiles of this and compare all of our simulations to some of the observational results. So what you see here is an oxygen 6 column density profile. And recall now that we have a fixed third solar metallicity. Turns out that the observations indicate maybe a half solar or even 0.6 solar is a little, uh, a little more accurate. So this, these lines might be shifted up uh, in future runs when we self-consistently model the um, metallicity evolution. But you can see we're in the right general bar ballpark. Um, these observations are for roughly L-star galaxies. So the green lines here, which are the 10 to the 11 solar mass halos, aren't really supposed to match the data. But the 10 to the 11.5 and 10 to the 12 are in the right ballpark. You see something interesting that uh, has been seen in other simulations. There's a non-monotonic uh, response to the oxygen 6 column density with halo mass, which is um, pretty interesting. And I'd say we do a pretty good job on these warm ions, these 10 to the 5 and higher uh, species. But when we get down to the lower uh, temperature ions, it becomes much harder. So here's a Here's the neutral hydrogen column density profiles for our halos. And this is just picking some of the, the results that we've heard a little bit about already. And you can see maybe we do OK in the center. But I mean, it's pretty hard to explain with our model, with this really stripped down model, what's, what's going on out in the CGM. So we have 
I don't know if I mentioned this, we have like sub kiloparsec resolution down to a few tens of parsec, all the way out to twice the virial radius. Um, so maybe this is indicating that even with that high resolution, we need other physics. We need satellite galaxies or we need filaments. But the, there's also indication from some of these observations that these absorbers might be really small, might be less than a parsec. Um, so future work will address that. And I'll just quickly mention some future directions. And as I said earlier, if anybody has some things they think we should do, uh, please let me know. We're going to uh, let the dark matter potential evolve in time and try different mass accretion rate or mass accretion histories to see how the galaxies respond. We're going to put in filaments and we have some ideas on how we might actually accurately model these uh, shear layers. And then finally, I'd say the next paper we'll get out is uh, going to be just, this is the nice thing about using Athena. We can just turn on magnetic fields and anisotropic induction and see what happens. And we're finding that even with an extremely small seed field, we can get up to dynamically important magnetic field strengths uh, that are amplified by the vigorous turbulence. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, I'll be fast. Um, so I'm interested in the the clouds you do see, e even though you're not quite getting up there with the cold clouds. Yeah. D does the spectrum of their sizes go all the way down to getting close to your resolution? And yeah. okay. Yeah. So that's something that's been uh, really frustrating. Now we don't have any conduction, so there's no real reason why the cloud size should, should ever stop getting small. Um, but if you work out the field length, the field length is like a few parsecs at, at best. So yes, when we increase the resolution, we get more small clumps and it denser. It's smaller, denser, and more of them. Are they seeded by density? Yeah, so they're seeded in, in the two different sort of regimes. They're seeded by different things. So in the higher mass halos, it's mostly thermal instability that's forming them. And then in the lower mass halos, uh, it's just sort of the the shocking and the vigorous turbulence where you get some, some density peaks. This is really beautiful work. Um, I had two questions about the details of how you inject the, sure. the, the material in the center. First of all, how do you decide what temperature to inject it at? And secondly, have you, have you tried any kind of model where you store up some of your uh, outflows for a short while so that you, you then get the effect of the sort of burstiness. Yeah. Because a, a student of mine did a study on this and found that you can really exacerbate these thermal instabilities and get cold stuff at large mm. radii if you have very bursty feedback. So the bursty feedback I have not tried at all. It's something that I was talking earlier this week to Zach about. Um, it's a totally good experiment. I mean, it's something that we could try very easily. The time step in these simulations is around 10 or 20 mega years. So it's roughly the lifetime of you know, a massive star for, to go to type 2 supernovae. Um, but it's definitely something to try out. And then as far as the temperature of the winds, we tried out a bunch of things. So uh, I only really presented models that had kinetic feedback, but we also tried ones that had some fraction of the energy going into thermal energy as well. So that's essentially setting the temperature of the wind. And we found very, as long as there was some kinetic energy, uh, we found very little difference. So we, we just, we inject the winds all at 10 to the 4 Kelvin, which is, uh, the injection radius is about 10 kiloparsecs. And so this is, uh, I think, roughly consistent with some models by like Todd Thompson, where you expect winds to adiabatically cool by the time they get to 10 kiloparsecs. Um, yeah. uh, oh, we, uh, OK, one more question. <laughs> I'll be quick. Thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, this is really interesting. I was wondering if you've already started experimenting with the filamentary accretion simulations, and if you have any idea of how that might be different? Yeah, so uh, as has been seen in cosmological simulations, my filaments thus far penetrate straight down into the halo. And so I don't know if I can trust that because, you know, I, I'm, this shear layer right here is like four cells across. And in my experimenting, and as in yours too, we need about 100 cells across. So I don't think we're really accurately capturing the mixing. So I don't, 
My gut reaction is I don't think the filaments are going to penetrate nearly as efficiently as has been seen. Okay, let's thank uh, Drummond again.